Welcome to SME's AM Influencer Series, dedicated to the passionate professionals who volunteer with SME to connect the digital thread of additive manufacturing within traditional manufacturing. My name is Adam Penna, your host, leading customer engagement for our SME additive manufacturing community. Our guest is joining us from Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, Todd Grimm. He's the additive manufacturing consultant, writer, and presenter with 30 years in the industry and 25 years as an SME advisor. And he's a big part of this year's Rapid Plus TCT with a, a panel I'm looking forward to on the breakthrough of manufacturing within AM. Todd, welcome. Thank you for welcoming me. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to be here and yeah. looking forward to sharing that excitement with attendees and potential attendees to Rapid. Yeah, there's a lot going on. We've had a bit to talk about before getting started here, so it's been a pleasure getting to know you a lot more and actually preparing for what's happening this year. I know we all have a history as far as what we've been through in our career in manufacturing, and getting into additive has always been a little bit different. And so that's been my question is, like, what was your first experience with additive manufacturing like? Oh, well, a lot of my persona, what I do on stage and in writing, which is, I call it enthusiastic realism. I hate hype. And a lot of that is carved out of me getting in the industry with a service bureau back in 1990. And my first impactful thing that was transacted that was hyped up was 3D Systems had an ad in 1991 advertising overnight prototypes. Mm. At a time that we could spend a whole day just slicing files on these little 286 computers. Well, everyone started calling us expecting overnight prototypes. And when I said, no, it's going to be a week or 10 days, these potential clients would get upset with me. And that kind of kicked off this whole uh, role that I've done on, for myself, being the little boy that says the emperor has no clothes. Mm. And not to hurt anyone, but to make sure that the average Joe, the average Jane out there doesn't swallow a statement lock, stock, and barrel without questioning it, which may or may not be true in their situation, their circumstances. So yeah, early days really carved my personality by being affected by claiming, oh, and oh, also way back then, 1991, 92. Me, others in the industry, other service bureaus, we were making the statement that injection molding, you better watch your back because yeah. we're coming for all your business. So we threatened them in 1991, 92. You're the that, one who started all that, Kadra. <laughs> well, I, back then, yes, I had a role in it. But uh, luckily, I rapidly realized how foolhardy that was. What we actually did was we poked the sleeping bear. Right. And it woke up and said, oh, these guys are coming after us. And- Things improved and what was, you know, kind of a stayed process, you know, injection molding, likewise, CNC machining had the same thing, but we kind of woke them up and they said, okay, there's a competitive threat. We better get on our game. And now we see faster ways to, of tool making. We see faster cutter speeds, you know, high speed milling yeah. starts to come about. And all we did, it was juvenile idiocy that we made that bold proclamation when here we are 30 years later nowhere near doing that. And I firmly believe that this disruptive kind of thought process is insane. Mm -hmm. It's going to be about marrying the two, an additive and a traditional, and figuring out how they dovetail, but more importantly, discovering what the crossovers are so that the company, the manufacturer can decide which one's best to use in what circumstances. Mm -hmm. But right there, that's a huge ask, Adam. That's a, a lot to ask for anyone to come to grips with additive. I'm sorry, I'm just going off on this, but- No, it, it's good. It, yeah. It, it, it's And this is why an event like Rapid plus TCT is so important. If you allow me to go here with this, additive on the surface looks like any other traditional manufacturing process, you know, workflow kind of things. And yes, it adds material instead of subtracts. And there is a lot of synergy and alignment with things, but it's the differences that'll get you. Mm. So we've got some- differences that require new thoughts, new processes, new controls, new initiatives, that if you don't account for those, you may find that you can't get the justification, the value proposition isn't there. Or if you don't account for those, you may find yourself heading down towards an initiative and hitting a roadblock. Right. And now it's like, oh, wish I had known that. So it's a big ask. There's a, there's, you've got to take what you know, and then just determine what you need to understand in order to execute properly before you even pull the trigger. And how many companies really have the resources to invest that amount of time to get that amount of expertise just to make the decision? And so coming back to Rapid plus TC, you know, it's an event where you go and you walk through the show floor, 
you attend the conference sessions, and you absorb information to help you along that path, that journey to making yeah. the right decision. Yeah, it's important for uh, manufacturers to understand that there's a lot that you have to kind of absorb. But yeah, like you were just talking about, I've heard this used a lot, the right tool in the toolbox, you know, and, and AM is just part of it. It might not be your solution for your particular application, but you should know where the values are, what the benefits are, because if you can do something there, there is a lot of value. And that's what we're starting to see out there is turning that page of understanding where the benefits are and additive instead of just looking at it as, oh, I'm going to print the same exact part on that machine that I've yeah. been doing this other way for so long, that's written rarely, if ever, the solution inside of oh, yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, I often say the traditional manufacturing companies out there, and I, I say that that could come across as negative context. That's not what I'm doing, but just trying to create buckets and additive versus traditional. With that, it's a hard thing to achieve because even you find people where, well, let me back up. So what the statement I was going to tell you is if I've got a widget, and all I'm looking for the exact same widget, but better, faster, or cheaper, the odds are about 90, 10, that additive isn't going to work for you because it can't necessarily deliver what you already have. It's going to deliver something different. So you right. got to seek out those differences and then determine whether you can live with those, those that aren't positive and how you leverage the, the benefits. But yeah, it's laughable. And we've all seen it. You know, someone comes to you with an obviously sand casted part that's had some finished machining on it. It's a big block of metal and says how much and how long to make this an additive. Mm. And and you look at it, it's like, that's not an additive part. Are you willing to invest in redesigning that part to improve performance or other characteristics to make additive a great solution? And status quo starts to take over. I hate status quo. That's, I think, our biggest enemy where you've got a momentum thing where you mean I've got to invest time and energy to redesign that just to make additive work. Heck with that. You know, I've got other things to do. Boom, right. back onto the old way of doing things. So we've got so many doors that can close on a manufacturing initiative if you don't have the proper insights and the proper guidance, which isn't easy to get either. I mean, it's not available, generally speaking, on the web. It's somewhat available through virtual conferencing and, and other things we've been doing through the, the pandemic, but you miss a level of depth. I get frustrated. You know, our attention span as human beings is short. So yeah. if I'm doing a panel discussion for an event, usually there's a 20 or 30 minute time limit on that. And that's nothing. Right. That 20 to 30 minutes just evaporates and you leave so much good meat on the bone that's never discussed. But it's got to recognize that most people aren't going to sit there for more than 30 minutes to listen, to find those additional tidbits. So what I'm coming back to is getting back to face-to-face -face an event like Rapid Plus TCT. Now you're immersed and it's mm -hmm. more likely you're going to, through assimilation, osmosis, just being in the vicinity, to absorb some of these tidbits to at least cause you to say, you know what, never thought about that as a question that I need to have answered. So face-to-face, -face, I'm excited to get back to face-to-face, -to -face. excited to uh, see that Rapid is, is happening in 2021. And then as we're recording right now, we're a month and a day out from the doors opening. So there we are. Yes, we are. You had some great advice in there for manufacturers that are getting into implementing AM. There's a lot to look into, and it's not a 30-minute conversation. But once you have that resource, you know, it's something you can go to when the appropriate moment comes along for the application. You talked about DFAM in there, Design for Additive Manufacturing, and that's a big part of it. You know, that initial phase, not coming in the back and it's saying recreate this exact same part once it's already been through all the phase of design and everything else like that. You have to kind of kick it back to the beginning. And a lot of companies... Companies don't want to do that because they're already rolling forward. So there's like the crux of the situation. Is it that affordable? Is it something that we want to do inside of our process? What has to become part of the process in the beginning? And that's education and knowledge. And Rapid Plus TCT is a great place to pick up that kind of knowledge. But there's a lot of other events that also have that kind of knowledge and people out there that you can network with. And when you're not at a show, that's the big part of being at the show. Get that network tied to those people that you need to find those things out and then bring it into your real world every day. You know, it's not easy. Easy, but it's part of the whole manufacturing game is actually getting together and finding out how other people are doing something so you don't have to have a big learning curve into getting or at least a lesser learning curve into getting started. It's somewhat related, but I have a thought that I want to offer as a, a bit sure. of helpful guidance. At Rapid Plus TCT, on the show floor in conferences, you're going to run into a lot of people that are either self-proclaimed experts mm. or others proclaim they're experts. It's very easy to self-proclaim. And there's a lot of people out there that I just want to smack my forehead and go, 
Oh, and this isn't self-serving by any means because I don't know everything. First off, no one knows everything about exactly. additive, including you know all the technologies, all the applications, all the steps in the process, how to implement, how to control. It's a beast. Additive in that context of all those elements is more like saying additive is a amount of things you need to know and, and master. It's akin to all metalworking technologies. Mm. It's not akin to CNC milling. So milling, routing, drilling, boring, EDM work, laser cutting, water jetting, you know, it's much more like that. So just imagine as someone stepping into it to really get your hands around and know what tool to use and how to use it, we're mm. asking them to have at least a decent appreciation for the pros and cons of everything from laser to water to, you know, a cutter hitting, hitting a part. So it's tough, but back to the experts thing, I'd highly recommend if you're getting information from somebody, ask their background. Sure. You know, don't, don't put them on the spot and make them look like an idiot, but say, you know, Adam, you just said this, and I can see where that's true in the real world. Where have you been involved in putting that into practice? Because mm -hmm. the really dangerous thing, and you and I talked about this and, you know, coming up with kind of where we wanted this conversation to go, People will tend to come up with an answer if they're viewed as an expert, whether they have the answer or not, mm. because almost a sense of shame. And I used to have that problem. I honestly, you know, Todd, what about Acme Corporation's new metal additive machine? And if I didn't have the answer or know it in depth, I'd feel that I was letting somebody down. I wasn't doing my job. I wasn't a good consultant. And over time, I'm like, you know what? It's ludicrous to even try to do all that. You're going to be so thin, you know, you're going to have this little thin layer of information with no depth to it. Why bother? So now I'm more than comfortable. have been for like the last 15 years. You ask me about something. I'll say, don't know anything about it other than the headline that I read. Why do you find it interesting? And look to you to convince me that it's not worth my time to go research them. So just, you know, get a sense of where they're coming from and why should you take what they're saying as truth? to get context on things. So that's true at all events, but it'll be true at Rapid Plus TCT. On the show floor, meeting other attendees for the conference, you're going to run into a lot of people with great information, but just say, where are you coming from, dude? Yeah. You know, context uh, and perspective, right? And yeah. it's something that we all have. And, but, yeah. uh, and you clarify you too, because I think the worst offender is the self-proclaimed or perceived expert who has five years experience in additive. And what that means is they worked with a $3,500 desktop machine doing extrusion mm. and now they're telling you they know everything about it well that's a very different beast than mm. the more expensive industrially oriented tools so that person now wants to act like they know everything and they tell you something it may be way off base just because they're coming from a baseline that's much different so yeah. i'm sorry i'm pontificating way too much for our audience so i'm wasting your time but hopefully no you are i'm loving it keep it going because it's all good information obviously there's so much happening inside of industry everyone has a perspective everyone has their own thoughts mm -hmm. on it and i'm valuing everything you have to say right now so please don't hold back this is great i won't but so I guess to move it forward on that, the whole industry has had an impact over the last 30 years inside of manufacturing with additive coming up and maturing. What do you see as the biggest impact or what are some of the impacts AM has had to the broad manufacturing industry as a whole? Wow. The industry is too broad for its own good. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got nothing to focus on. That question right there is just huge. It's expansive. But uh, how can I boil that down to some high level things that generically can be applied across the board? Well, first off, you know, even going back to the 30 years and reiterating that point, it's spurring people to rethink what they're doing and how they can do it better. Yeah. And it's spurring new thoughts and ideas. You know, the whole industry 4.0 concept, distributed manufacturing concepts, they're intriguing and there's obvious benefits when that's pulled off. But, you know, additive plays a role, a deep role in that. So I think at the highest level, it's, it's facilitating conversations that have the potential to change mindsets to do things differently or better. But again, it's a big ask of most human beings. Bringing new solutions. An easy one that popped in my head is mass customization, but quite sure. honestly, I hate that term. <laughs> I hate that term. How about personalization? Is that one all right for you? Personalization's okay, yeah. but is there really a value proposition there? Because I'm old school. Well, I'll give you an example. I'm short, I'm all five foot four. I cannot buy dress shirts and dress pants off the rack and have them fit. Okay. Dress shirts. Do I ever bother to spend an extra 15 bucks and an hour of my time to get the sleeve length adjusted? No. Mm. 
Now, what's my solution? I could go buy a custom shirt. It's personalized to me. I don't. Why? I'm cheap. So I spent 100, 150 bucks on a custom made shirt, which also I got to go through the effort of getting, you know, measured and all that and then picking up and, you know, make sure the fit. So there, where does personalization really have value? And there are some markets for it. And there's some markets for it. But mass customization, I think, leads people to a bit of a fantasy. Because if we look at it, how many products really need to be customized for each buyer? And in my mind, wouldn't it be a better solution for most things we buy? For anything that contacts the body or interfaces with the body, yeah. Okay, customization is needed. So headgear, oil work, you know, hearing aid even. Yeah, I get that. But everything else... Isn't it a better solution to use additive to come up with a broader set of SKUs on a given product? So instead of giving you two flavors, small and large, instead of going all the way out to mass customization, which is a logistical nightmare, what about going extra small, small, somewhat medium, medium, large, extra large, XXL, and all the way out? So now yeah. instead of two options, you've got 10 leveraging the power of additive with its ability to do smaller batches, change those batches at any time without any cost. So I'm sorry, now I'm really getting off on opinions, but I've cringed on that. And I even use the term industry 4.0. I cringe on that because my first gig was in the CAD cam space, technical sales for Unigraphics, which was the McDonnell Douglas product named Unigraphics, which is now Siemens NX. Yeah. And at that time, the big pitch was computer integrated manufacturing, all things tied together digitally for a smooth workflow. Well, and I was part of that hype too, as a salesperson, but what ended up happening was it became obvious that was a marketing term to re-energize thoughts and conversations, to drive people to look at different products and elements of it came true. But even though it was promised two years from now, back in this is the late 80s. It never came to fruition. So I'm concerned on concepts like Industry 4.0. How much of that is a marketing-driven thing or high-paid consultants who want you to be convinced that if you're not Industry 4.0, you're going to die tomorrow so I can get a half a million dollar consulting contract? I'm not saying that's all true, but I'm just very wary that it is something that's viable and achievable in a relatively reasonable frame of time. I'm not saying it's not but it's also a hard path. I had a panel I moderated just last week and we're talking about digital security. And one of the panelists is like, for us, and they're defense oriented, they're, all bets are off. There's no way in hell we're doing industry 4.0 because mm -hmm. we haven't figured out how to protect that digital thread throughout the entire workflow so that uh, bad things don't happen. So as you can see, I'm coming across negative, but I justify it in being pragmatic so that people ask the right questions and don't assume, you know, and certainly you're going to rapid plus TCT. Don't assume that additive is the solution you need. Instead, enter into it with an attitude of discovery. Ah. Where could I use it? Why should I use it? And then finding, discovering some of the solutions that would fit your needs. There's a lot of value in there, obviously, because you're talking about things like coming off as a realist. There's both sides of it. And some people might hype up the digital value chain in Industry 4.0 because you were talking about it even with Unigraphics. That's the beginning of the CAD side of it. It's digital. You're going through. It used to be the dream to press a button on a machine and you have this digital thing that comes out. There's a lot more work that goes in behind that. And it's not just the gloss of the one button pressed and you have something done. And that might be a lot of the false hope out there is, okay, yeah. I'm just going to put it in there and press a button. It's going to happen. So I'll tell you a funny story. Yeah, it's, it's, go it's for the, it. Yeah. the headlines that go out there or the fantasies that are put out there. I got asked to speak at a trade association annual gathering for HVAC, heating, mm -hmm. cooling, and ventilation. Started. Yeah, definitely. All right. Cool. The reason I was there is the members thought that their repair business was going to be gutted because someone would roll up with a van and 3D print the part that they needed and install it. Mm. And, and so manufacturing in a box was the concept that they were being fed and they were believing. And, you know, it was my goal to say, oh, guys, you, you're safe. You know, you're, you're really safe. And here's why. But you've got to develop enough of a quizzical mind to question what you're hearing to discern what the truth is. But the truth is always related to your specific business circumstances. What kind of part you're producing? What are your business threats? What are your business opportunities? Where are your weaknesses? An additive may play there. It may not play there. So it all depends. And this panel that I'm doing, it's what you need to know. 
in an initiative to get into manufacturing using AM. And that's all predicated on there's some key stumbling blocks. And if you don't understand and have fully qualified what you really need, you can shoot yourself in the foot. And, you know, and one of those, you know, the, the classic engineer using a block call out for tolerance, plus or minus 5,000 across the board. You do that on an added manufacturing part, you're not going to have a cost justifiable application in most cases. It requires an understanding of where do I really need plus or minus five? Can I get around that? And then identifying those areas that do demand it and saying, okay, that's my spec, which may force you into a secondary machining operation. I think added manufacturing as a workflow and mentality is mm. much better aligned with the metal casting industry than it is the machining industry. Because there, if you get investment cast parts or sand cast parts, you're designing an as cast part and an as machine part, allowing for machine stock, because you know darn well yeah. that uh, you're going to have to hit it with a grinder or a cutter on let's say two mating surfaces on a flange to get them flat and, and really sealing. So the mindset of it's a multi-step process to get what I want, I think really feeds into where additive plays. So I actually like additive as an alternative to investment cast or sand cast part for the uninitiated versus an alternative to a machined part because Makes the sense. expectations align. You know, machine part I think it's really easy to fall into the mindset of what you've always seen, which is I can produce a finished part off of my CNC. Yeah. Well, it was designed for that. Control frames, you got yeah. your GD&T that you have to get in there. And yeah, that's where it becomes, if you're saying the tolerances aren't quite there to follow yet inside of the uh, 3D printing process. However, that's where the post-processing picks up and you end up machining things that you could have come up with if you were doing it that way in the first place. So there's that balance of understanding where it's going to go opposed to where it's been and trying to find a middle ground in there to go forward. I think there's a lot to be learned in there. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, first off, if you plan to attend Rapid Plus TCT, hats off to you. Kudos. I'm glad you're going to be there. If you're on the fence, I highly encourage that you register today to get there. Now, for those that do attend, high level advice for you, back to that discovery, use it as a discovery platform. What solutions are out there? What problems can it solve that maybe you don't even have top of mind? So enter with eyes wide open and an open mindset to absorb as much as you can and develop a list of prospective solutions, which you investigate in detail you know, thoroughly after the event. But I suggest you enter into it with eyes wide open, be willing to absorb anything coming from any direction, whether you think that it applies or not. But at the same time, I highly recommend that you really pin down what it is you're trying to do and what your key requirements are. So what is the application? What is the part size? What are the characteristics of those parts, including material and tolerance and all that to allow you to ask questions aligned to what you're trying to address? Because yeah. if you step up into a booth, you're looking at a metal additive machine and you don't have that framework, now we can go broad again. And the answers that you're getting from the person representing in the booth may or may not apply to your part. So Very general. Is it, yeah. A, yeah, is it a thick, beefy part? Does it have thin walls, small details, blah, 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 blah. You know, even the tolerance thing, you know, you'll look at spec sheets and a lot of them will have, you know, kind of a plus or minus five statement for the first X number of inches. If you ask what tolerances can you hold and you don't specify the context that you're asking, you can get an answer back. You know, generally we can hold plus or minus five. Well, as additive manufacturing practitioners, we know that something like tolerance and the ability to hold a spec could very well be dependent on the part size. There you go. So, and there's something different versus traditional manufacturing. You think of feature characteristics and accessibility with a cutter, if you're milling, for example, to define what's possible in a tolerance thing. Now, it added, and this isn't new news. I'm just using this as examples. To, you you got to understand what you're trying to achieve before you step on the floor. But with additive, it's not as straightforward. How big is your part? How thick are your walls? What material are we using? Even if you change material on the same platform, you can get different profiles out of what's possible with tolerance. So and back to Rapid Plus TCT is a great place to go to gather this information, at least to get you started with what's possible and who the potential solution suppliers could be, because there's just so much information that's required to execute soundly and high probability of success.
100%. That's great advice. I know we were talking a bit about this, and I wanted to unpack a little bit of something you said there. Mm -hmm. I know it's a, it's hard to do in each industry and in each application, but in general, when you're setting it up in an application that you're looking at uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing for, it's very important to have, like you're saying, a business case, right, of why you're doing it why you're doing it, yeah. but even before you attend the trade show, like a Rapid Plus TCT, you have to have a business case so you ask the right questions when you're going in front of somebody. So maybe talk a little bit about that if you can, like what would you say is the best way to prepare a general business case here? And I know that can go in depth in different ways, but what advice would you give to a manufacturer out there who's starting to set that up? I continue to scare people who are just stepping into it. Again, it's additive is different. Hmm. All right. So I think the strongest business case is when you're delivering something that's currently not practical, or maybe even impossible, as a deliverable. It's unique. So your choice is now binary. Either we do additive and have a possibility of succeeding in this front, or we do nothing and we get the same results we've always had. Now, binary is a lot more easy to justify. So how much value is in that? But what it means is that you have to have a deep appreciation for your own business because what I'm asking you to do is to come up with possible gains that are outside of the norm. Now, your head down, an engineer, manufacturing engineer, your head down, you're probably thinking in terms and context of the things you've always been pressed to achieve. But now I'm asking you to look for things that aren't even possible that you probably don't even spend any time thinking about or pondering because... It wasn't possible in the past. And it, we don't talk enough about inventory. So, you know, logistics and inventory, I use that because it has been talked about, but it never sticks as a high level topic. You know, maybe it gets folded in with logistics. But if you look at traditional manufacturing, for the most part, you're looking at economic order quantities, which force you to place orders of X number of pieces to get the best price. And those X pieces go on the shelves. Hmm. Now, what is the true cost of having that on the shelf? You're tying up capital. You've got to insure it. You've got spoilage, which is theft, you know, breakage, just losing it. You got floor space. Space itself, yeah. Okay. So right there, doing additive and more of an on-demand batch operation, you could deliver all these benefits. But how many people really ponder that as a benefit that goes beyond what traditional can do? And many do. Many do. Don't get me wrong, but many just fail to even see the opportunity. And that's where the better justifications are when you're doing something you can't possibly do. I had one client a decade ago doing a plant tour and he shows me a warehousing area and it is high value specialty items, but he proudly proclaimed that they were going to be blowing the wall out and adding an additional, I don't know, 10,000, 25,000 square foot of warehousing. And we kept talking and they had all, everything because damage could not occur to these parts, including abrasions and scratches. Everything was in a Tupperware tote, hmm. everything. And I happened to say, can I open a few of those? And, and he said, sure. And I did. And I look in and they were using like a nine by 12 inch Tupperware tote with a part that was three inches, but they couldn't put a second part in there because they, if they bang together, right. it would cause damage. And I said, you know, here's a, something off the wall. What about using your mid range extrusion machine for additive? What about using that to make custom holders so now you can put two parts in one or other strategies like that and now prevent you from having to blow out that wall, spend millions on facility modifications? Wouldn't that be a better solution? Mm. So it's that kind of stuff that I really challenge people to see. But back to a very high level, attacking time, cost, and quality, and everything else stays the same. That's a loser's game. It's rare that you're going to win, especially with the kicker of risk aversion. So let's say I can give you reasonable benefit in time delivery, reasonable benefit in unit cost, and I give you the performance that you want. All of those are incremental gains. Now we have the outlier out there of risk aversion. So doing something new, what's the likelihood that somebody in the decision-making chain is a little more risk averse than others? Hmm. and says, you know what, for that marginal gain, it's not worth trying something new. So I really encourage people to look for the big, the bold the winners. And I'll give you an example. I've used this many times. Hearing aids have been disrupted by the additive manufacturing technology. Now, it's very specific. It's in the ear hearing aids, mm -hmm. period, and making the shells. Now, I can tell you for a fact, additive manufacturing does not reduce the cost. 
and does not reduce the time over what they were doing back in 1992. Right. It's actually more expensive. Now, I don't know relative to today versus 92, but in, when it was first started being deployed, that was a fact. Now, I'll leave you with that question. Why in the heck would hearing aid manufacturers convert to a digital additive manufacturing workflow if it would cost more and, and took just as long? Hmm. If you want, I'm not putting you on a, on the spot. That was a, that was a dramatic pause for effect. Um, <laughs> if you'd like to take a guess, feel free. My guess would be what you were referring to there is inventory wise, something that they make could be old technology. It could be personalized for that person's ear, something that they could do by scan to print type of operation instead of actually yeah. doing something that's an ABC hearing aid off the shelf. I got to clarify. So the market I'm talking about, they were custom in the ear hearing aid shelves. Okay, okay. Now the old way of doing it, they had the audiologist press clay, basically a material right. in your ear, pull that out. Now you have a negative what your ear canal is. Mm -hmm. Then they got all those in, in a batch. They put them on a hard substrate standing straight up and they vacuum formed over them. Mm -hmm. So bing, 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 bing. Now I have a tool. Then they used a resin with a known curing rate. They'd pour the liquid resin in each cavity and oscillate for 2.5 minutes, pour out the rest, and they'd have a hearing aid shell. That's how quick, that's how cheap it was. The benefit was that when they went through that traditional process, there's a bit more manual adjustment. So a technician manually affecting the hearing aid shell, the number one reason you return a hearing aid or are disappointed with it is poor fit too loose, too tight, uh, causes problems. The digital workflow using scanning and stereolithography, I think of most, they found that it was a, a more accurate representation of each individual client's ear canal because they took out that manual intervention mm. and return rates on hearing aids plummeted by, I think it was like 40% back in the 90s and it plummeted down to something like 10%. Wow. Now, Look at the financial impact on that. So you've got that big delta on returns. That means you've got more capacity in your current operations so you can make more profit with the same people. It means you, you've got uh, the same facility. You don't have to enlarge it. And you've got uh, less cost to do replacement. So those are the kind of big wins I really challenge people to find. But it is a big ask. I kind of suggest brainstorm with some people. I make widgets. And I talk with Adam, or I talk with somebody at the Rapid Plus TCT show. I make widgets, and here's what I'm doing. Here's what I think some of my issues are. And just open conversation, D using your network, as you already mentioned. And you might find that somebody has an idea like this one out of the hearing aid market, where it's like, you know, you could really change your business in a totally different way. And that, that could even be expanding your target markets going upscale, going downscale, because you don't have that heavy capital investment just to ramp up manufacturing. So it could even be just a great way to say, you know what, I want to try, not a true pilot, but I want to get product out there and see what the demand is, mm. you know, beyond a simple, like, you know, test case, you've got investment. Yes, but the investment is a lot less significant. So maybe it's a way that you come up with new markets by region or new product types. So think differently, I think is the key. Big time. Yeah. yeah. It opens up that thought path to get to somewhere else when you're in front of other people actually exploring those different options that someone who has the experience before you to actually give you that time that they spent failing. <laughs> so you don't have to, hopefully, I guess yeah. that's the dream there is less. And that pl plays into 3D printing with iterations, you know, quicker iterations, quicker failing, and you get to the solution a lot quicker that way also. I'm going to go way back for two more stories to stress this think differently. So I got in added to manufacturing with a service bureau in 1990. And our materials were brittle. They weren't good for much more than models. All right. So we're having a hard time selling to mechanical engineers because they don't even have the strength to assemble pieces without the threat of breaking. So forget functional testing. The service bureau I was with was the third in the world to be founded. We got one SLA 250 and we don't have a market. You know, we've got a lot of interest, but we're not selling. So someone, I can't remember who it was. It wasn't me. He said, you know what? We need to go after the industrial designers. Mm. Okay. And, and we started doing that, and the industrial design community was absolutely gobsmacked, as my friends in the UK would say, over the potential of this. But they never bought. 
under the current mindset because what they were doing, their deliverable was a looks just like the real thing mock-up that only had the external surfaces represented primarily for the goal of putting in the middle of the conference room table for all people to ooh and ah over. Mm. They didn't at that time think about a rapid iteration cycle as being the true benefit. And it wasn't until they did that it took off in that community. So trying to do the same thing, but differently, it failed miserably. The other one is even, you know, being careful of falling into what you think are requirements. And this comes from circa 2000 automotive manufacturer, big name, rolling out a new vehicle. And they had a limited number of vehicles going on dealer lots for the big launch. Well, they ran into a problem with delivery of a component, happened to be a plastic polymer component. Believe it or not, back in 2000, technically everything was okay to put this on the vehicles. And my service bureau, we're just like ecstatic because this is going to be a big order. This is, you know, going to be great for us. And I got to the last question for them placing the order. I said, how many would you like? Without even thinking, he said 5,000. I said, I can't help you. He said, why? I said, the time to make 5,000 pieces is going to be astronomical. The cost is going to be astronomical. You won't buy those. And then I had the brashness to ask him over the phone, why in the hell do you need 5,000 pieces? Hmm. He stopped for a second. Mold that over. He said, I'll get back to you. A few days later, he gets back. And I said, what do you need? He said, 200 pieces to start, 100 pieces each in the next two months. I said, great. Where the hell did 5,000 pieces come from? He said, he giggled. And he said, well, for plastic parts, someone did an economic order justification for injection molding that came out to be parts in this kind of category. You never buy less than 5,000 pieces because the additional pennies for each piece it doesn't matter if you throw them away or not. And I said, well, and just for giggles, how many of those 5,000 pieces you guys usually just throw away? He said, you know, more than half. So anyway, it's dangerous to fall into what you think you need without questioning it. So I'm sorry to waste time on that. Adam, no, that's a great example. That's not a waste yeah. of time, right? You just yeah. save some people time. That's a valuable story there. I know we're going to be seeing each other at Rapid Plus TCT this year. So I'm looking forward to that. I know you're going to be doing that panel there. There's a lot of great things going on. And we'll also see you in the mornings for the kickoff there. But it's the 30th anniversary this year of Rapid Plus TCT. And I was just, well, yeah, it is. It is. There you go. 30 well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait. So I just got this in the mail yesterday. Uh -oh. So it's my... You know, the program guide, yeah. which if you didn't get one, maybe reach out, see if you can get one, but it's jam packed with activities, but I saw nothing in here referencing 30 years. So 30 years, 90 years of SME, 30 years of rapid plus TCT. Okay. And so how has well, your experience been all those years? Yeah, overall positive. And it's been a pleasure to help serve the community, help it grow and move on. But you know, 25 years, if we look at it in the context of a marriage, there's rocky spots, you know, disagreements and, you know, uh, difference of opinion. But overall, it's been a pleasure. It is a labor of love. It takes a lot of time. The last couple of years, many of the last years, it's been an advisory role for the conference side of things. So that's identifying what are the topics that need to be discussed, paring that down, and then saying who's the best suited to speak to that topic and, you know, vetting speakers on that to come up with a final agenda. And when the conference closes and you hear people with positive feedback on the content and the speakers and all that, it's kind of a psychic paycheck. It feels good, you know, so that's why I do it. It's been fun working with them, but, you know, certainly challenges along the way. We all grow and move forward. Yeah, this pandemic has brought along a lot of different challenges, obviously. Oh, and uh, now uh, moving into the latter part of the year, we're seeing some other stuff that are challenges, but at the same time, the live events are something we all love. So looking forward to making them happen. Yeah. One bit of warning for those that have registered or planning to register, if you're thinking of just one person, don't. Uh, here's my prediction. So since we've had COVID going on, lockdown-ish kind of situations for the last year and a half, a lot of pent-up interest in getting to a live event. But equally on the supplier side of things, a lot of pent up interest to get new product in front of you. Uh, so I expect rapid plus TCT to be somewhat overwhelming with new stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be fun, but also, you know, kind of the good with the bad, it might be so much that it overwhelms you. So that's what I'm saying. Bring two people divide and conquer. Cause yeah, it, what we got 280 ish booths. 
And yeah. I was just doing the math. Cause, well, I've got to walk through all those booths for the projects that I'm doing for Rapid Plus TCT. And I'm like, you know, if I stopped at every booth for 10 minutes, that's 50 some hours. And that doesn't even do it justice. The show floor isn't open for 50 hours. Let's say you only have an interest in half the booth and you mm-hmm. give them 10 minutes to really digest what they have. That's still 23, 24 hours, which would be every moment that the show floor is open, which means you can't sit in any of the conference sessions, which by the way, uh, well, we got three keynotes and 11 expert panels that are free to everyone. So if you're registered for the event, you get to partake in those. Then you have the paying component, which is the the conference with breakout sessions. But if it's just you, you're not going to see everything on the show floor you need to see, and you're not going to be able to sit in all the panels that you want to see. So highly recommend two, three, four people, depending on the size of your organization, to divide and conquer. Because I can't guarantee it, but I think it's going to be almost deafening with the amount of new stuff that's being touted on the show floor. Yeah, it is an exciting year for that. Everybody, like you're saying, is wanting to show where they've been and their latest and greatest technology that's out. So we'll see a lot more of that in the actual conference floor there, the show floor that's going to be happening right in front of us. Uh, everything new and everything uh, distracting. So yeah, the, the more people you have to attack that, the better. There's a lot to see. We we're talking a bit about the AM community. You know, there's everything mm-hmm. from the makers to the production side of things. And it could be that everyone inside of the community is a lot different because they are. They come from, like, you're, like we're saying, either the desktop area or the production area and everything in between. But what do you say defines the AM community? Openness. Okay. Because we're still struggling to penetrate deeply in all applications and in you know, all industries, that vibe from the early days of we can't do this alone and succeed is still there. So I believe now I've never been in the machine tool world, but I've been told as a contrasting that with additive, you're a lot more likely to get insights from somebody that may even be a competitor. So a willingness to share. So going to rapid plus TCT, set your mindset that way. Expect that people be willing to share because odds are that's what's going to happen. If you go into it with a, any other mindset, expecting people not to share, you're not going to engage. You're not going to ask the deeper questions. I think people are shocked with that openness and additive. And now I'd say most people attending Rapid Plus TCT at least have some exposure to it. So what I'm telling you, you can probably decide for yourself whether that's true or not. But I think that's a defining element of additive is the openness. Yeah. It's the a lot community. More of that. In the community over the pandemic, obviously, we've all had to open up uh, our cameras and our mics and our lives just be a little more connected that way. And I'd like to see that keep pushing forward because things are evolving and our communication is evolving. It's all part of it. Talking about evolution, that's the big question Mm -hmm. there. How do you see AM evolving? Incrementally. So I'm not a big believer in revolutions and disruption. Now, it can happen in isolated cases or let's say specific niches hearing aids was disrupted but not all hearing aids so not and not all auditory uh tools used to assist people to hear better so it can happen but don't expect it across the board and generally speaking so i I think it's one of the expectation best used is one of good you know it's it's still dynamic but incremental gain and mastery as we progress towards the future. So instead of straight up hockey stick, it's going to be sloping line where every day, every week, every year, we gain more information, we gain more technology, we gain more understanding. And that information is shared back out to the community, allows us to penetrate deeper and deeper in an incremental fashion instead of an overnight flip the switch and the world changed. But, and it's hard to look out really, really far, but with what, I'm aware of regarding the the technologies. I think the long-term expectation should be one of additive augments. It doesn't displace and look at it as a solution of where do I need it? How do I integrate it into my mindsets, my workflows and all that? So it becomes a valuable tool to fill the gaps where other technologies falter, fail, you know, or fall short. So that's my expectation. Many people now are familiar with Gartner's hype cycle. Yeah. Well, 
the slope of enlightenment is exactly that. And their hype cycle has applies to any emerging technology. So you go through a hype bubble, then the trough of disillusionment where overpromised, underdelivered, people get disappointed. Then you dig yourself out and you continue up the slope of enlightenment, which is all about, uh, let's say, practical research to solve real problems, developing the insights and information needed, which then can be disseminated. So improving technology, improving materials, improving software, improving workflow, but also having that be more publicly available instead of squirreled away. Because we're still, I said we're open, but uh, when it comes to expensive experiences, you know, we still see a lot of, it's my data, not yours, you know, intellectual property kind of thing, competitive advantage. Mm. If an aerospace company has done full qualification of, you name the material for a specific process, it's highly unlikely that that information is going to be handed out to the public. So we still have squirreling away, but with this slope of enlightenment, according to Gartner, there's more opportunity for those kind of data sets to be more generally available. So you know, maybe it gets rolled into a standard and part of the standard, you have to have that understanding. And now that's available to anyone who acquires the standard, that kind of thing. So more information available. So a, a deeper information flow will grow day in and day out, time over time. That is here to stay, without a doubt, in my mind, for all application, you know, prototyping through production and then legacy parts and all that. So it's not going to go away. And it's a matter of our industry, additive industry, and the potential users of it really come into grips with when it makes the most sense. So you look at a new technology that comes out and ask them where it applies and frequently, and then all, all technologies, it happens. They take a... Um, a poke at where they think the wind's going to be or the benefits or who's going to consume it. But oftentimes it's wrong because they're not ingrained in it. So they don't have a true sense of the dynamics of the market. And it's not until it's been deployed that they discover, ah, that's the big win. And that's, that's where awesome. we apply it. Yeah. So that still goes on today. And I think additive still in that kind of environment where it's not this black and white or this grotesque, but, you know, throw it against the wall and see where it sticks. Mm, yeah, yeah no. it's, it's even the top vendors. I think you really see it with their identification of the target markets they want to serve. For years, it was everybody and anyone. And then uh, we started to see a lot of we're going after aerospace and defense, we're going after healthcare. And then the other ones, you know, will vary by company what they're good at. But I think focus is needed, mm. but it's tough to focus in the early days because you don't quite know lo what the target even looks like. So you, a little bit of discovery to find what the target looks like and then hone it into that solution. And as we advance the slope of enlightenment, that will also improve a clarity on what we're trying to do and what value proposition we provide. Great advice and great insight there. It's been a pleasure talking with you today, Todd. There's so much uh, My that pleasure. get into. I'm looking forward to many more conversations. I'm looking forward to seeing you this year at Rapid Plus TCT. Is there anything else you'd like to share while we have you here? Feel free to grab me. I've got a lot of show floor activity to do on behalf of SME. So I might tell you, at, I got to be brief, but like everyone else, you know, hopefully I'm open. So feel free to grab me if you want to chat. Looking forward to many more conversations because I'm sure we'll have them. And I just wanted to say, Todd, thank you for being a positive leader and a contributing part of the SME additive manufacturing community. Well, my pleasure and much appreciated for the thank you. So, and my pleasure to be here for this episode. Thank you awesome. very much. Wonderful to have you here. You have a good one. You too.